Hi, welcome to a recording of the Washington University Library's workshop entitled Knowledge is Power, Fighting Misinformation, Disinformation, and Junk News. My name is Melissa Vetter and I'm the Biology, Psychology, PNP, and Philosophy subject librarian. Thank you for stopping by. In this session, we will discover terminology that can help us become more precise in talking about fake news, learn to spot unreliable news and control the spread, understand the role that bias plays in media manipulation, and locate reputable news media sources available to you as a member of the Washington University community. Everything I'll discuss is available from the link you see here on the screen, and I'll be working through the guide in hopes that you will return to it and try out the many resources listed later. In order to work through the guide, you can use the tabs here on the left. The term fake news is used quite often, but we want to set it straight that fake news is not news you disagree with. It's become a catch-all term that isn't nuanced enough to describe the information landscape, and many critics argue we move away from it. Here you see a listing of bad information sources and their definitions. Some of us, who've fallen victim to fake news stories and possibly even spread them through our own channels, might have been perpetrators of misinformation, clearly an error we would not have made if we were more informed. But some of the others are more nefarious, including disinformation, defined as information that is deliberately false or misleading, or those exhibiting extreme bias. Satire can even become a bad information source when consumers are not aware that the information is meant to be humorous in nature. Below, we've included a listing of additional news literacy vocabulary. Some terms, such as confirmation bias, might be familiar, while others like container collapse, used to describe what happens when information becomes divorced from its original information container or source, such as a newspaper, journal, or blog. We become locked in our own filter bubbles when search tools present us with the stories we're likely to click because we've clicked on similar ones before. We've all likely fallen victim to satisficing or consuming good information um, over optimal news stories. Maybe you've even seen a sock puppet posing as an online identity in order to deceive. While we might feel overwhelmed by the volume, frequency, and increasing sophistication of misinformation in all of its forms, there are ways we can learn to spot unreliable news. Always check the About and About Me pages or investigate authors' names to consider the writer's credentials. Take a look at those URLs, too, and bear in mind that anyone can purchase a .edu domain site. Trace back to an original study mentioned in a news article, or triangulate information by checking for the same story in multiple sources. Also, rule out hoaxes by visiting fact-checking sites mentioned later in this video. A very important skill to build is our ability to stop before we share. Can you verify the information outside of the social media platform where you discovered it? Try seeing if unlikely voices or those you don't often agree with are saying the same thing. Varying your information diet can be very beneficial to your news health. It's important also to be mindful of our search attitudes and biases and to always be suspicious of pictures. A Google reverse image search can help discover the source of an image and its possible variations. I'll demonstrate this skill a bit later. Finally, keep an eye on those comments. If a post is getting called out for being fake or misleading, it probably is. Another source you might like to return to later is a free online book written by Michael Caulfield entitled Web Literacy for Student Fact Checkers. In it, he cautions us that when you feel strong emotion, happiness, anger, pride, vindication, and that emotion pushes you to share a fact, quote unquote, with others, stop. Above all, it's these things that you must fact check. He goes on to describe his four moves and a habit. The habit is checking one's emotions and slowing down to use your moves. Move one is to check for previous work. Has the news already been fact-checked or is it available from a trusted online site? Move two encourages us to go upstream to the source. Trace back to see if you can find the original source of the information. Move three asks us to read laterally. If you're unsure about the quality of your source, Try to find articles on the same topic by other writers. On the left of the screen are questions to ask yourself as you do. 
Move four suggests circling back when you don't have a complete picture. You can stop and use what you've learned to begin a better informed search. On the bottom of the screen, you'll see additional tools for going upstream and reading laterally in academic sources. I also highly encourage you to watch the short video from the Stanford History Education Group on lateral reading. Here we see a PSA from the News Literacy Project, one of my most trusted sources of news literacy education. If you click on it, you'll find additional advice for good information hygiene. Here too are links to reliable news fact-checking sites, including factchecked.org, a project of the Annenberg Let's open that up. The Annenberg Public Policy Center and Snopes.com that's been around dispelling urban legends, folklore, myths, rumors, and misinformation since way back in the 1990s. Additionally, we see that behavioral economist Cass Sunstein has identified four main types of rumor propagators, those who promote self-interest, those who promote the interests of a group, those motivated by malicious intent, and those who act for altruistic reasons. In the case of the coronavirus pandemic, we see all of these motivations playing out in our social media feeds. You might be surprised to discover the biggest misinformation vector in the current crisis is people acting on the altruistic impulse to help others avoid infec infection and sharing misinformation without realizing it's false or misleading. So to help stop that, below is a collection of COVID-19 related misinformation resources that you can use to help fight the infodemic. Evaluating news sources is one of the more contentious issues out there, but it's important to remember the distinction between news gathering and news analysis. News gathering is the act of doing the investigative work, checking and publishing facts, whereas news analysis takes those facts and strings them into a larger narrative. When certain sources are dismissed for slanting a certain direction, the biases can often be attributed to the news analysis portion of their work. I encourage you to come back and spend some time with the media bias chart shown here, if you're not familiar with it. It's produced by Ad Fontes, which means to the source in Latin. Their main premise is to analyze content. They look as closely as possible at individual articles, shows, and stories, and analyze what they're looking at, the pictures, headlines, and most importantly, the sentences and words. I've included a link to their rating methodology and a video to the left that explains the project and future goals. Taking a look at the media bias chart, you can see there are essentially four buckets where news sources can situate themselves. Most reliable for news in the green, reliable for news but high in analysis opinion in the yellow, some reliability issues and or extremism in the orange, and serious reliability issues and or extremism in the red section at the bottom. You can zoom in on the chart to locate a particular source or scroll to the, let's see, let's zoom in can find a particular source on the chart to see where they fall. Or you can go to the bottom of this page and see information about each individual news source. So if you're unfamiliar with a source, you can click on it and look at the bias and reliability overview. It'll give an overall score. And then we'll also highlight all of the articles that were reviewed in order to determine the score. I'm not going to spend much time with this, but I hope that if you're interested, you'll come back to delve a bit deeper into the editorial guidelines, standards, and ethics of reputable news sources. Also remember to look for the bylines, just like you would with a scholarly article. Check to see if you can find more works by that particular author. Is this an area where they tend to write frequently? Google their names. Does their background and experience qualify them to write on this particular article topic? 
So here's something you can do for fun. On this page, I've collected several online games that you can play to help hone your fact-checking skills. Remember, as you do, to keep your fact-checking tools such as Snopes at the ready, as well as your other secret weapon, Google Image Search. I'll show you how to use that in just a moment. So click the links and try them all. With Factitious, you'll swipe right for real and left for fake. The News Literacy Project's easiest quiz of all time, shown here, is not so easy. And Uncle uh, Cranky Uncle is the newest game I've been introduced to, and it was developed out of George Mason University. It also helps players identify how loud logical fallacies are used in media manipulation. So here you'll see I have the game Fake Out open, as well as Google Images in a separate tab. You can check your browser's available extensions for tools that you can use, such as Google Image Search or TinEye, that make it possible to right-click on it and search an image. In lieu of that, I'm just going to show you how you can drag an image from one tab to the next. So I'm on the game Fake Out, and I've been confronted with the question of whether this news story is real or fake. The headline is, Teen Light Lights Driver's Armpit Hair on Fire Causes Crash. So one way I could do this, I could investigate the source, check it out in USA Today, or I can take the image and even with just that Google Images tab open next to my game, I can drop the image into a search, perform that search, and I can even tinker with the, the terminology. So I could maybe try um, armpit hair so one of the first links that comes up is from USA Today that same article that we looked at another from NBC News and as I go down there are several news sources that I could check out and it appears that this is in fact a true story so I hope you'll have a good time and maybe learn a bit from these games when you have a few minutes. It's important to note that none of us is immune from personal bias. And content creators rely on their understanding of confirmation bias to get us to take their bait. Our confirmation bias is the subconscious tendency we have to seek and interpret information and other evidence in ways that affirm our existing beliefs, ideas, expectations, and hypotheses. Again, preying on our strong emotional responses. It explains why, how it is so easy to create filter bubbles, those spirals we can get ourselves into where we keep reading the same type of information and algorithms. They pick up on this and keep feeding us the same flavor of information. It might be a hard pill to swallow, but many experts recommend varying your information diet. Find authors or people you can trust that have stances that differ from your own and read what they have to say on occasion. On this page, you can also come back to a video with suggestions on five ways to beat confirmation bias. Related, I also wanted to mention that research on fluency, the ease of information recall, and familiarity bias in politics shows that people tend to remember information or how they feel about it while forgetting the context within which they encountered it. They're more likely to accept familiar information as true, so if you keep hearing the same misinformation over and over again, even in a fact-checking context, this may increase the likelihood that you'll accept it as true. <coughs> the internet, especially social media and mobile technology, become increasingly able to create customized experiences for each individual searching or browsing information online. In some ways, this can be a positive thing and definitely very handy. For example, when you're visiting a different location in the world, your Google search results will run through localized filters to bring you the results most relevant to where you're currently located. Google knows where you are. This content customization goes beyond advertisements, though. Facebook feeds, for example, can become information echo chambers, flowing content based on what the algorithm or program predicts you will most be interested in. This can place you in a virtual world of information that only affirms what you already believe rather than challenge you to think outside of your bubble. Here you will find information 
that might allow you to take back some control over those algorithms. It lays out what you can and can't do to help control your feeds and various social media platforms. And this is likely old news, but our search engine algorithms are also helping to reinforce our existing biases. This video from the Southern Poverty Law Center shows how the Google searching algorithm effectively narrowed the perspective of Dylan Roof roof because he searched for white supremacy information. In this example, other points of view were not represented because the Google search results privileged hate sites. Okay, enough doom and gloom. We know the issues that exist. Now, what can we do about it? Some say we need to learn to challenge respectfully. It's okay to challenge what others say without the conversation completely devolving. Pointing out when statements are false benefits everyone by helping to uncover the truth. This is a great article I recommend you come back and take a look at. Here's another helpful site from the World Health Organization. It gives directions for reporting misinformation online. It's super handy and gives you the steps involved for several social media platforms. It's up to us individually now, or at least that's what someone who made a great living creating disinformation um, before he saw the harm that he was causing said, this is another great article. You can also find sources that fall more central on the media bias chart to consume. If you're part of the Washington University community, you have a wealth of resources here at your fingertips. If you're an undergraduate, you can get semester long access to the New York Times. Just follow this link and sign up. Another great subscription you have access to is called Press Reader. It's a full color, full page, digital version of newspapers from around the world and some magazines too. Check out the other links on this list when you're looking for news media sources, as well as a research guide to newspapers which has a lot of information, including historical and archival newspapers. On the Research Help Ask a Librarian tab, you'll link to a page that offers a chat service available 24-7, as well as other ways of getting in touch with subject librarians. Additionally, on the last page, the additional resources Many of were mentioned today during our, my talk. Others you might want to check out if you're interested in this topic. I'm going to come back and view them later. Thanks again for visiting with me today and for helping to try to stop the spread of false information. Please be in touch if you have any questions or would like to follow up on any of the items that I discussed here today. Thanks. Bye.